Good morning, everyone. Kevin here from Skywatcher, and welcome to another episode of the What's Up webcast. We do this every Friday, 10 a.m. Pacific, right here at the Skywatcher USA YouTube channel. Uh, today is Friday, August 18th, 2023. Uh, that's when this episode aired for anybody watching this in the future. Um, so, uh, part of our team is actually out at Starfest up in Ontario, Canada. I was hoping to be there, but had some family stuff come up. Everything's fine, but just had to be home. Um, so sorry, I wasn't able to be there. Uh, hope you guys have a good time out there and maybe next year if we go, I'll, I'll see you guys all there, but you can still stop by and say hi to our team. Jeff and Jared are there. Uh, say hi to them. They're hanging out with Trevor and Ashley from Astro Backyard as well. So hopefully it's a good time up there at, uh, Ontario Starfest. All right. So today we're doing an episode on a telescope that probably doesn't get enough love, but anybody who seems to own one adores it. Um, so that's going to be the Starlux 190. Uh, this is our Maxitoff Newtonian. Uh, this is what we're going to be covering today. Uh, but real quick, just a couple little things. If you like what you see here on the What's Up webcast, please go ahead and subscribe and leave a like on a video. It lets us know we're doing a good job and that we should keep doing it. Uh, if you have an episode idea, you can email us at info at skywatchusa.com and title it What's Up. It lets us know what you're looking for. Um, I will let you know that we do have pretty much the entire uh, rest of the year of 2023 pretty much planned. So if you are sending video ideas over, they will likely not be put into place until next year. Uh, just so you guys know. Uh, another couple things, if you want to support the channel, please go over to skywatcher.threadless.com. You can get all kinds of cool shirts and swag. All this goes to helping the channel and keeping it going. Um, and then it also gives you some cool stuff to match with your Skywatcher products. And then just another little reminder, the uh, annular eclipse that is going through North America is on October 14th. So now would be the time to make plans. Uh, for the majority of the country, it's just going to be a very deep partial eclipse. But um, there is the annular if you're on the path. Uh, now, Focus is my outreach program. And we did Seoul, which is the Solar Observing Lab, last year in October. And it was pretty popular. And we had some requests to do it again. Um, this year, we won't have a lot of our solar vendors that were there uh, from last year because they're going to be at various eclipse venues. But if you're local in Phoenix and you want something to do and just do a get together of all different kinds of solar stuff, come check out Seoul. Um, we'll have all kinds of telescopes for observing the sun. Uh, your entry into the event actually also gets you passes into the Earth and Space Exploration Center. They have a planetarium, meteorite display, all kinds of stuff inside for uh, space exploration. So not only do you get to go uh, observe the sun and the eclipse, but you also get to go through the museum as well. Uh, we are going to be extending the time. Uh, so after the eclipse is over, which is around 11 o'clock AM, uh, we will keep the telescopes open later in the day. So the times that you see there, uh, 8 AM is still the start time, but we are going to be pushing that out a little bit later. If you want to come later, even after the eclipse is over, uh, we will have solar glasses there and all kinds of other fun stuff to use. So come on and check it out. Uh, we hope to see you there. Uh, and if you need to know more, you can go to focusastro.org. So there you go. All right, so let's get started. Um, so today we are talking about the Starlux 190. I did not come up with the name, so don't ask me. Um, but the Starlux 190 is a very unique telescope in our lineup and also just in the collection of telescopes that are available on the market you don't see maxitoff newtonians that often anymore which is unfortunate um i'm gonna kind of kind of go into the details of why the mac newtonian is kind of a very interesting design but it's often overlooked primarily because of refractors and their simplicity but we're gonna go over the mac newtonian particularly our 190 but we'll We'll go into detail about it. So let's get down to the basics of understanding just the general idea of a Mac Newtonian. So Mac Newtonians are a variation of the Newtonian design. Light goes down, hits the parabolic primary mirror, jumps up to a flat elliptical mirror, uh, and then 
out into the focuser, into the eyepiece, into the camera, whatever the case may be. Um, and there are variations of the Newtonian design. Of course, there's the Maxitoff Newtonian, which we're talking about today. There are Schmidt Newtonians, which you don't find too often. Um, there are Laurie Houghtons. Uh, there are all kinds of variations of the Newtonian reflector using various correctors in place. But today we're talking about the Mac Newtonian because it's probably one of the more obtainable designs, obviously, because we sell one. Uh, but there are other ones on the market. Probably the most well-known ones over the past, you know, in the past would be uh, the Saravalo 145 and 216 Mac Newtonians, which are unbelievable world-class telescopes. If you are looking for an amazing telescope that performs very similar to an APO refractor, they are a bit rare, but for what you can get them for on the used market, they're pretty affordable. Um, the 145 is probably easier to find. The 216, the Cerevalo 216 Mac Newtonian, very difficult to find. Um, but I've had the pleasure of using one and phenomenal. And then, of course, you have Intes. Uh, Intes has made Macs uh, before, and they do have quite a bit of uh, Mac Newtonians varying in different specs. Um, and then, of course, there's also ours, the 190, and then there's the Explore Scientific uh, David Levy Comet Hunter, uh, which is also another popular one, which I don't know that's in production anymore. But um, anyway, uh, there are all kinds of Mac Newtonians on the market. So at the front of the Mac Newtonian, you have the meniscus corrector. And if you've ever seen a Mac Cassegrain, it has that really steep corrective element in the front. That's what we call a meniscus corrector or a Maxitov corrector, however you want to say, but the true way is a meniscus. Um, then you have a spherical primary in the back, focusing light up to that elliptical secondary flat, and then up to the side. So the way that looks is light comes in, lights focus from the primary, and then up to the focuser into the eyepiece or camera or whatever you're using. Um, so that's basically how a Mac Newtonian works. Now, one thing I'd like to elaborate on is there's a lot of uh, speculation is a bad way of putting it, but there's a lot of talk that Mac Newtonians are better than other designs and all of that. And there's really nothing special about the Mac Newtonian that really sets it apart from any other design. Um, it has pluses and minuses like any other telescope is going to have. However, one of the major reasons that I think we could talk about is a Mac Newtonian is a very elegant system. There's not a lot going on with it. The individual components are not terribly difficult to make. A spherical primary is very easy to make. Um, you go from spherical to parabolic. Uh, so a sphere is a lot easier to make than a parabola. A parabola is easier to make than hyperbolics. Hyperbolics are normally found on like rich accretions and stuff like that. Uh, so a hyperbolic is a very difficult mirror to make. Parabolic is found in pretty much any Newtonian, any real Newtonian. Uh, there's a lot of cheap Newtonians out there, Newtonians out there that are using spherical mirrors and you get all kinds of weird stuff like that. Uh, but then in a Mac Newtonian, most of the optics are spherical, at least the primary is and so is the meniscus corrector. Uh, so the primary is very easy to make. The meniscus corrector, however, is a different story because a meniscus has two optical surfaces, unlike the primary. The primary just has the front-facing reflective surface. You only have to polish one surface. Now, the meniscus corrector is, is just like a lens. You have to polish both sides of it. And the meniscus has to be a slightly different figure than the primary mirror does and it also has to be set in a very particular position or distance from the primary mirror in order for everything to work because basically what is occurring is the meniscus uh, is actually putting spherical aberration into the system and once you pair the meniscus corrector up with the primary mirror and they're both spherical they tend to cancel out the aberration at that point so you get a corrected system. It's kind of an interesting part, but the spacing that the corrector and the primary need to be from one another is critical. 
So probably one of the major things that sets the Mac Newtonian design apart from others is the amount of effort that has to go into making one. And when you're assembling one, it has to be very precise. The tolerances are very tight on a Max Atoff Newtonian. So probably one of the reasons when comparing it to other designs that Max t Mac Newtonians tend to be maybe a little bit better is because the amount of effort and finesse that goes into making one of these as opposed to other designs. Um, there's more care put into it because it has to have it. So that's something you should know about. Um, so the meniscus corrector is spherical, like I said. So both sides are spherical, but they are slightly different than the spherical surface of the primary mirror. The primary mirror um, is also slightly larger. So most Mac, actually all Mac Satoffs, um have a oversized primary mirror or they should, because the way it works is when light passes through a men, um, meniscus corrector, it actually tweaks out a little bit. It flares the light beam out a little bit. So you need a larger primary mirror to catch it um, as it goes. So even though on ours, the Starlux 190, even though it's a working aperture of 190 millimeters, which is 7.5 inch, um, the, uh, the actual primary mirror is 200 millimeters so it's an eight inch um it's an eight inch f5 sphere is what the primary is figured to on ours but because we're using the meniscus corrector and there's a bit of masking around the edge of that to stop it down to 190 um you're getting the 190 millimeter f5.3 system and that's going to be true for even the Maxitoff Cassegrains. The Maxitoff Cassegrains that we offer do have slightly oversized second or primaries um, to allow for that flared out light path a little bit. So I don't have all the measurements in front of me for every single one, but for the Mac Newtonian, it's a 200 millimeter primary, and then the working aperture is 190 millimeter. And that's pretty common for all Mac Newtonians. The primary is going to be larger than the actual working aperture. That's just how the design has to work. Now, like I said before, it's a very elegant design, but it's not easy to execute. There's a reason that you don't see a lot of these being produced by amateur um, opticians. You see Newtonians. Newtonians are very easy to make the parabola. Uh, for the primary, you can get elliptical flats from all kinds of places, or you can make your own. But the the really difficult part about these telescopes is that meniscus corrector in the front. It's a very difficult system, or it's a very difficult piece of optic to make if it's not done correctly. Um, so the spacing has to be just right to match up with the primary um, a lot of times the optics on these are clocked and positioned to be in a very particular spot. So if you own one of these, I would never recommend taking it apart. And if you, for whatever reason, have to take it apart, you make sure that you use like blue painter's tape or whatever it is to mark the positions. Now, if you've ever seen one of our Starlux 190s up in person, there was one at Neef this year. That's where this picture was taken. Um, this particular telescope has several screws near each cell, the rear cell and the upper cell, that allow you to position them in certain ways. And it is very important that if for whatever reason you need to take yours apart, and I would not recommend it, that you pay attention to the orientation because all this stuff is actually matched at the factory and clocked into the position it needs to be in. So be very careful if you, for whatever reason you have to take one of these apart or work on it or clean it, that you make sure you mark every spot so you know exactly where it needs to go. Now, the most critical point here, and it's kind of hard to mess up on this particular one, but the most critical thing here is the distance between the Maxitov corrector and the primary. That cannot be moved because if you move that, everything's going to look bad. So... Um, it's an elegant design, but it's a very critical design. The tolerances, um, are very critical here. Uh, does the low error tolerance implies that they don't require collimation? These telescopes do require collimation 
and the way ours are designed is a column H just like a regular Newtonian. They do hold collimation really well though, um, but I would recommend checking it. I check any Newtonian every time I use it just to make sure we're good to go. But we've shipped these all over the place and they, they hold collimation pretty well. So I find that you don't have to mess with them too much. Uh, so that's something. Now, some like I said before, uh, under tight tolerances, requires careful spacing of the primary and corrector. That's done during the assembly and the design phase. That's something you shouldn't have to mess with. Uh, corrector sits within an aperture stop, which reduces coma. Um, actually, a typical Mac Newtonian has about 30% less coma than a Newtonian of similar spec. Um, obviously, if you got a, a coma corrector or something, that helps. But um, right off the bat, a typical Mac Newtonian is going to be about 30% less uh, coma. Um, the corrector does put spherical aberration in, and then when paired with the pr spherical primary, they tend to cancel each other out. Uh, these provide a very well corrected field, though. The design is very nice because A, it's fairly flat. Um, it's a lot flatter than a typical Newtonian is going to be, um, but fairly flat and no coma. Um, so they're a very nice system to use both visually and astrophot for astrophotography. Um, now, another big plus to a Mac Newtonian, it depends on the, the design, but there's no additional optics needed, uh, particularly for astrophotography. A lot of times if you get something like one of our Quattro Newtonians that are F4 or a similar Newtonian, you're going to get coma. And... Comas where all the stars at the edge of the field look like, you know, they have wings on them, like flared out. We call them seagulls or they look like comets. Um, you're going to get coma, especially the faster the optic. But Mac Newtonians do a pretty good job at correcting for that. So you're getting a very refractor-esque uh, view when you look through one of these. And then if you hate diffraction spikes, which I know some people do, uh, because the secondary is supported by the meniscus corrector, there are no, there's no spider or secondary holder there holding the secondary in place. It's centered in the center of the meniscus corrector. So there's no diffraction spikes. So you're getting a very refractor-like view or image. Um, honestly, the 190 is probably about the closest you're going to get to a 7-inch APO refractor without spending 20 something thousand dollars so a good mac newtonian is going to perform like a very large aperture refractor um, a very good refractor um, here's an example of what a mac newtonian can do you know as you can see there's no diffraction spikes it's very clean uh, the stars out to the edge look well corrected um, we'll go into a little bit more detail um, with this image a little bit later um, but it's a very well corrected field on this one um, wait hold on just a sec looks like I had some stuff we already went all over this I had a there we go let's move forward okay Starlux 190 so let's go over just the specifications of our particular telescope here um, it's a 190 millimeter working aperture so that's about 7.5 inch focal length is a thousand millimeters which makes this really nice for a lot of the cameras out there right now um, if you're using a modern camera like a 533 or a 2600 with those 3.76 micron pixels, a thousand millimeters is really sweet. Um, it, the image scale there is going to give you a nice field of view and it's going to give you enough image scale to where galaxies and smaller targets look really nice, but it's not so long that you couldn't do some wider field stuff, particularly with that larger sensor like the 2600 or the 571 is technically what it is uh, for astrophotography purposes. Now, our Mac Newtonian here uses a 64 millimeter minor axis secondary. So your image scale, or I'm sorry, your illuminated field on a Mac 190 or the Starlux 190 is going to be best suited for those APS-C size sensors and smaller. If you're after full frame, you really be pushing it with one of our 190s. Um, 
full frame is still demanding on an optical system. So I think that's a lot of reason why some of the higher end refractors are fairly popular or you have these very exotic reflectors like the Delta Rho or the larger Rosses from Celestron. Those can handle those big sensors. But for the price that this telescope is, it's very well corrected for the crop sensors and smaller. So if you're using a 571, which is a ZWO2600 or a QHY or whatever the variation of it is, um, this will work really well. Now it's also f5.3, so it's pretty fast um, for what it is. Let me bring this up really quick. I'm going to go use Scope Wizard, which is our app here. Let's see the speed difference. Um, most refractors that are going to be around a thousand millimeters nowadays, let's just say it's like a 150 millimeter refractor um, at about a thousand millimeters, like our Esprit uh, 150 or similar. Um, they're going to be about F7. And F7 is not bad, but if, if you wanted to speed it up in to f5.4 you need a, a big reducer now you're looking at like maybe four hundred dollars five hundred dollars or more depending on the brand to speed it up to f5.3 or f5.4 whatever it comes to you're going to be spending a lot more money natively out of the box you're at a thousand millimeters so your image scale is great for a modern camera and it's fast at f5.3 so if we're comparing f7 to f5.3 this is 70 percent faster than an f7 telescope which means your images are going to be 70 percent shorter or you're going to get 70 percent more data in the same amount of exposure time so the nice thing about this is it has a good image scale and it's optically fairly fast so it's paired really well with these modern cameras now it is a little bit heavy this is one of the downfalls of the mac newtonian design not only do you have the primary mirror in the back, which it's an eight inch primary, it's not a heavy thing. The correctors in the front, the meniscus correctors have to be a certain thickness. And this one is nearly an inch thick. It is a bunch of glass in the front. So the weight wise, this is not a telescope that's particularly lightweight, but if you're looking for a well-corrected refractor, well in the same aperture class let's say like a 150 160 180 apo this is pretty similar in size but that's because we have that big old corrector in the front um so you're gonna need something like eq6r bare minimum this would be this pairs very well with the cq350s that we make or like a los Monde g11 or something in that 50 plus pound payload capacity if you're going to be doing imaging for it it works really well with one of those um, now our particular one the starlux 190 comes with mounting rings and a v-style dovetail plate you have an 8x50 right angle finder scope we do have a dual speed crayford focuser it does have an inch and a quarter adapter and it does have compression rings um, we give you a two inch to t-ring adapter if you just want to pop your dslr on there and the meniscus corrector is fully multi-coated. Uh, this is an important thing to pay attention to if you're actually buying a telescope. You want to know if it's fully multi-coated or just multi-coated. Fully multi-coated means both surfaces or all surfaces have are multi-coated. And that's going to help reduce glare and reflections and all kinds of crazy things that can go on those coatings make a big difference in performance um, but you want to make sure if you're buying a telescope but that has like a lens in it of some kind that those lenses are fully multi-coated which means all surfaces are coated with anti-reflection coatings now we our primary mirror and secondary mirror use our radiant aluminum quartz coatings we call them rack uh, coatings now, what's nice about these is they're 94% reflectivity, and this is pretty much true for all of our reflecting telescopes. 94% reflectivity, which is quite good, uh, actually. And then we uh, have a quartz overcoat on our optics to make sure that they're gonna last a long time. Um, as you go up to larger and larger mirrors, we'll say like one meter or bigger, it's very, very hard to get a quartz coating on those things. <coughs> Excuse me. 
And that's why a lot of the professional observatories are removing their mirrors every other year or so to do maintenance and recoat the mirror because the mirrors on a large professional telescope are so big that it makes it very difficult to put that overcoat on them to extend the life of the coatings. Most amateur telescopes are going to have that uh, quartz overcoat on them and that allows the coatings to last for a decade or more depending on the conditions that it's it resides in. Obviously if there's going to be more moisture in the air, if there's a high salinity you're near like the ocean or something like that that can degrade coatings a lot faster but if you live out in the desert or a very arid environment it's not uncommon to have coatings on a mirror last 20 years or more between coatings at that point um, so the coatings that are used on our mirrors are very very durable and they have a very high reflectivity on them so uh, allows for very very good light transmission and make sure you're getting all of it uh, here's another shot. This is the Cone Nebula, or I'm sorry, this is the Cocoon Nebula. Um, very dense star field, and if you look close, you can actually see it's it, it looks like a refractor took this. Um, I believe this was with a Starlight Express M25C, so this is a crop sensor. Um, but you can see how well corrected it is. There's no color aberrations because it's a reflecting telescope, so you don't have to worry about any you know chromatic aberration on it. The stars are pinpoint. All the way to the edge and it's just sharp and that's you're basically getting all the benefits of a refractor style image um, without really having the expense so you're getting the aperture you're getting the focal length you're getting the speed and it's all well corrected at the same time and that's kind of the advantage of the mac newtonian design people just freak out because it's a newtonian and when you say newtonian everyone just corresponds that with i have to collimate it it's not a big deal um, some highlights about this particular telescope and something I do want to bring up that I forgot to mention. Um, so the Starlux 190 is probably one of the best baffled telescopes that we make. It's pro if not probably the best one. Um, if you ever have a chance to see one in person, it is so dark inside one of these telescopes because there is no reflections coming from it so this has knife edge baffles all the way down the tube um the back of the secondary is blackened as well which helps with any kind of reflections now behind the secondary against the tube opposite the focuser so over here opposite the focuser inside the tube we also have uh flocking behind it which makes it very very dark um, we do have a rear cooling fan mount. You can put a computer fan on the back. Um, it's held by two small silver screws. Um, there's a cap on that. You take that off. It exposes a portion of the back of the primary mirror and you can mount a computer fan back there. If you feel the need to cool the system faster, it is a closed system, obviously, because everything's in one tube. So there's not a lot of ventilation um, so that is an issue with Mac CASs is generally you want uh, some kind of cooling capability to help vent them out uh, because they do get hot because they're closed. Um, so there is a rear cooling fan mount on the back of the second or uh, primary uh, cell. That's what I'm trying to say. Uh, now in the front, which is what you see here, this is the front cell. There's the meniscus. If you see these little holes, or every 120 degrees there's a set of them those are cooling vents so as hot air comes off the back of the mirror it rises out of the tube and cools out around the meniscus corrector so as heat rises it goes through the tube up and out the cooling vents now if you have that uh, mirror or that fan on the back of the mirror it's going to rush air on the back of it it also pushes air back up, forcing air out the cooling vents. And those cooling vents do have mesh in there to keep as much dust out of the system as possible. But there are cooling uh, capabilities on this as well. Uh, now, the focuser on this particular telescope, like I said, it is a Crayford, dual speed Crayford. Um, but what's interesting in it is it has an internal retractable draw tube that you can extend in or out. Um, and that's a pretty cool feature and it's needed if you're going to be using this for visual work. So 
on a Newtonian, you have very limited travel on the focuser. So this one in particular, there's a little thumb screw, you loosen that and this whole extra draw tube extends out to give you more focus travel if needed. If not, it sits flush inside the draw tube, ready to go if you need. Um, and all of that has a brass compression ring. So it's, it's actually very nice. Um, these also have matched optics. Like I said before, you want to make sure that if for whatever reason you need to clean the inside of this thing or you need to take them out, everything needs to be clocked. So use blue painter's tape or just don't do it at all. Um, but this particular telescope is very precise in the position that it needs to have. Now, one thing I didn't mention before is the secondary right here. When you get one of these, these collimate the same way as a Newtonian, but a lot of people question, how do I do it? Um, now the back of the primary, it has push pull 120 degrees apart. There's two set, there's three sets of two screws. There's a little lock and then there's a Phillips screw back there. And it's a standard Newtonian push pull cell. So the primary collimates normally. Now the secondary does that the same way, but a lot of those screws are actually hidden. So when you get one of these and you're trying to figure out how to collimate, you need to grab the cap here. So this is a metal thread on cap that threads onto the back of the secondary housing. So that's gonna thread off and inside there's going to be a lot going on and i wish i had an example of one i don't have one sitting around to show you um but let me so underneath this cap there's a couple things going on in you'll see recessed down in there there's going to be five screws three of them are phillips and they're higher up there's a center screw and then there's another Phillips screw that sits a little bit lower within the collimation screws and is opposite that of the focuser. The center screw is the mounting screw for the secondary. Do not mess with it. Leave it alone. The, the Phillips screw that sits lower, the one that's opposite the focuser, is the clocking screw. That is keeping that secondary in the right position. Do not touch that screw either. It's If you mess with the center screw or the clocking screw, you're screwed. Like, it's going to mess this stuff up a lot. You're going to mess with the spacing. Just don't touch them. The only three screws that you need to be messing with when collimating the Mac Newtonian are the highest three Phillips screws. They sit as high as they can, and they're 120 degrees apart. Those are the only three that you need to touch inside of here. Now, also underneath this cap is a machined knurled ring. And that is the locking ring that keeps the secondary housing mated into the meniscus corrector. Do not loosen that either because A, that's going to loosen the entire secondary assembly and cause it to spin within the corrector, which completely messes everything up. But if you completely remove it your whole secondary is going right into the primary mirror because um, that's what keeps it mounted so when you need to collimate your mac newtonian 190 take the front cap off unthread this black cap right here and only mess with the highest three phillips screws and do it one at a time and that's how you're going to collimate your secondary just like a normal newtonian it works very well, and odds are you don't have to mess with it too much. Um, these hold collimation very well, but there's a little bit more going on in here than a typical Newtonian, so that's why I'm trying to let you guys know. Now, another thing that freaks people out when they first look through one of these, if they're just staring at it, is the secondary is actually center marked with a ring. It's a Sharpie ring. Um, some people freak out that there's a scratch on the secondary. It's not a scratch. It's actually intended to be there to help position everything when these are assembled. So that ring on the secondary surface is supposed to be there. It's not a big deal. It helps the factory align everything and it will not affect any of your images whatsoever. So just be aware. So... 
obviously, like we said before, you're getting refractor-like images. There's no diffraction spikes, because as you can see, there's no secondary spider holding all of that in place. Um, yes, I should have provided a diagram for the secondary screw placements. I, I wish I... I don't even know why I spaced out on that, um, but I should have done that. That's my bad on this one. And the nice thing about these is they are flat field. There's little to no visible coma, and they're fully corrected for all the major stuff that us amateurs are looking to do. So here's that cone nebula again. And we're going to break this one down a little bit more. I've run this through a bunch of different things so I can show you guys how this actually looks. Um, now these are not perfect, um, but they are extremely acceptable for what they are. Um, so this is taken on an MN190. This again is with a Starlight Express M25C camera. So it's a pretty good size APS sensor. Uh, here's the CCD inspector of how flat it is. Now this is actually very nice. This is a very good, uh, rendition of a flatter field. Um, it's not 100% perfect, but it's very acceptable, especially for a sensor this size. So anything smaller is even better. Um, and honestly, the MN190 is designed for those crop sensors and smaller. So if you're using a 2600 or a 533 or a 294 or something like that, you are good at this point. And this is no additional optics as well. Now there is a little bit of tilt here. You can see on the right hand side, it's a little bit high. That could come from a couple different things. Um, tilt does happen in a system and the faster the system is, tilt becomes more present. I don't know all the details about the particular camera that was being used if there was tilt on the sensor, but a lot of modern cameras also have uh, tilt plates if you need to really dial this in. But this is a pretty, uh, acceptable flat field right here, especially for something that's just out of the box. Um, so for most of the people out there, this is excellent. Now let's break that image apart again. Um, this is run through PixInsight so you can see all the corners. I guess I could have blown it up again, but from just a standard perspective, everything looks very nice. Um, the stars look good. The corners look good. I'm sure if you blew this up 200%, you could find something that you wasn't acceptable. But when you're looking at an image and the fact that a lot of people just throw images on Instagram now, this is beyond acceptable for what we're doing. Um, so astrophotography wise, it's a great system. It's well corrected. There's no coma. You don't have to pay for any additional correctors. You pop it out of the box, you put it on the mount, balance it, pop your gear on there, and you're ready to go. Um, there's no thought process behind a lot of that. Um, and like I said earlier, it's best suited for APS-C or smaller sensors. So that works out really well. I know there was a question in here. We blew through this a little faster than I thought. The shape of the Magnetonian corrector. Oh, that's not the question. Uh, this may sound crazy, but I'm considering selling my Explore Scientific 152 carbon fiber um apo for this scope what do you think um looking for a little bit more aperture and tired of kneeling at zenith um yeah so i don't know what size um oh explore scientific 152 okay let's do the math really quick um do 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 do, do. and if this is just visual um there we go let me do the math here so we have 7.5 six okay so this is for es fan he's in the chat um so you have an explore scientific 152 carbon fiber apo great telescope um it's a big refractor um but it's a great telescope uh one of the big problems with refractors i don't care who makes them is the bigger you get the taller the mount has to be and the bigger the mount has to be so um that is one problem if you have an f8 refractor like our evo star 150 or like this explore scientific 152 carbon it's f8 it's a six inch f8 that's a decent sized telescope so that mount's got to be five or six feet off the ground to really put that eyepiece in a good position when you're looking at zenith so it gets really uncomfortable at times or you're going to be down on the ground um and 
if you wanted to go any bigger than a six inch APO refractor, you're going to be paying a ton of money. Um, the most affordable seven inch refractors that I know are still $18,000 at this point. Um, the new ones on the market, you could probably find something used like a Mead uh, 178ED. That's even bigger. I owned one of those and my Paramount had to be six feet off the ground to make that usable at Zenith. I mean, those are humongous refractors. And then the tube just gets longer. So let's just go with that. Um, and then comparing the 152 millimeter aperture to the 190 millimeter aperture, you're getting 60% more light. So it, it will be noticeable at the eyepiece um, that there is a lot more light throughput on this telescope because you're running seven and a half inches versus six. So your images of the brighter objects are going to be more detailed and you're going to be able to dig in a little bit more into the sky because you're going, uh, you have 60% more light grass. So there, that probably isn't a terrible upgrade path if you still want the refractor-esque view, but you want it to be a little bit more convenient. So a Mac Newtonian versus a larger refractor is actually something that's probably worth considering for visual. Um, but you're welcome to spend your money any way that you like, but we appreciate it. Um, but yeah, that's just the math. You're getting 60% more light from the 190 than your 152. And it's going to be shorter. And it's probably going to be a little bit more convenient to where you're not actually on like the ground. So, um, let's see. Hi, Kevin. Great presentation. Thank you. Um, how flat is a Mac Newtonian compared to that of a Petzval Design refractor? That's a very good question. Um, now there's obviously going to be variables on how flat this is versus a Petzval design. I'd have to test it. And obviously there's several different Petzval refractors on the market nowadays. Some of them are longer focal lengths. Some of them are shorter focal lengths. It really depends. Um, and it would be an interesting test. But I don't know. That's a that's a very good question. I would have to say the refractor is probably a little bit flatter. But without actually testing the samples, it's hard to say. Now, the bigger the sensor is going to be, like if you start moving up to full frame, it is more demanding on the optics. So, yeah, it, it really just depends. Um... There's a lot of variables that are in that question there that we'd have to actually test. Um, the Mac Newtonian is probably going to be pretty acceptable for anybody running a crop sensor or smaller. It'll be flat enough for what you want to do. Um, if you're looking to go bigger than crop sensors, then yeah, maybe you should be looking at a Petzval refractor. Um, and quite honestly, some of the more affordable Petzval refractors don't handle full frame cameras very well either. Or they're they vary in quality so you don't know what you're going to get so if you want a refractor that can handle full frame that is a petzival you're going to be spending some money on it um but it all depends it depends on how big the sensor is going to be what the focal length is going to be the f ratio is going to be all those variables are going to depict on how flat the field is going to be all right guys um I finished this about a little bit more sooner than I thought I was going to, but that's okay. Um, if you have any questions, you can always reach out to us at support at skywatchusa.com. I do believe we have these telescopes in stock if you're interested in getting a hold of one of them. Um, what's interesting about these is I meet a lot of people at events and at trade shows, and this telescope has quite a cult following to it. You don't meet a lot of owners um, that have these, and those that you do meet will not let them go. These very rarely come up on the used market. There is one right now, um, but they're, they very rarely come up, um, and that's because a lot of people really seem to enjoy the performance of this telescope. Um, like I said, I've met countless people up there at events and stuff and anybody who's like i have a mac newtonian 190 i have not heard anybody say a bad thing about it 
Um, and that's just meeting random people at trade shows. So there is a cult following to this particular telescope. Uh, what's the weight of the tube? Uh, about 29 pounds with the accessories added. Um, you know, probably closer to 28 or 27 if you're just the bare tube itself. Um, I'd like to see if the scope is available with a matching dew shield and carbon fiber for weight reduction. We don't make anything in carbon fiber. Um, we used to make our quattros, the 8 and 10 inch in carbon fiber, and the factory discontinued them. The thing about carbon fiber is... It is lighter weight and it is very strong, but in these particular telescopes, the weight reduction isn't as much as you would think and you end up paying a lot more for it. So we have found that there wasn't a lot of need for us to have a carbon fiber anything in our lineup. So we don't make anything carbon fiber anymore. Um, and as far as a matching dew shield goes, you'd probably have to check with like AstroZap um, they make dew shields. I don't know if they make a matching one for this. It'd be pretty cool. Um, but I don't know if they make a matching one. We don't sell one, but I would check with AstroZap on it. Um, is the secondary mirror spot in the picture? No, uh, the, the mirror spot that you see down below there is the primary, uh, dot. Um, the secondary has a little Sharpie circle on it that marks the secondary's center point. Um, I don't have a good picture of that uh, right now. Um, let's see. I bet this whole thing looks like some kind of anti-aircraft rig. Uh, yeah, when you actually see one of these in person, like when we had them at Neef on the CQ350, which is a really nice combo for it, um, it looks like a piece of artillery. So, um, How easy is it to... I hate this little YouTube star thing they put in here that I can't see. How easy is it to collimate the 190 here? Max can be hard to do. Yeah, max can be very difficult to do if you have to mess with the spacing between the primary and the meniscus. You don't need to do that here as long as you haven't messed with anything. Um, if you get one of these, they collimate just like a Newtonian. Get yourself a, like a Hotec laser collimator. Pop that in there. Turn it on. Collimate the secondary. Go down. Collimate the primary. And you're done. It's it's a very easy telescope to collimate as long as the positioning between the meniscus and the primary has not been messed with. Um, that's where things get difficult. Uh, the meniscus is also need to be centered correctly. Um, so as long as you haven't messed with the main optical components, you're good to go. That's where Mac Newtonians get really troubling to work with. But as long as you just collimate it as we've designed it, do the secondary, then the primary, just like we've talked about, you're all set. It's It should take you no more than a minute or two to collimate one of these. And odds are it only needs a tweak if you need to do it. Um, I've never had one of these crazy out of collimation um, unless it's been messed with. Um, but anyone that's just production, it's a very simplistic telescope to collimate. If you've collimated a Newtonian or a Dobsonian, it's the same thing. You'd have no problem collimating one of these. They're easy. Uh, let's see. How big is the illuminated circle? I think it's 28 millimeters, if I recall correctly. Um, so it's best suited for those APS-C size sensors. You will have to take some flats to get that illumination, but that's pretty standard for a lot of Newtonians at this point, especially when you pop a coma corrector. But I think the illuminated field's about 28 Um which should be does pretty decent for a crop sensor. I could be wrong, but last I remember, I think that's it. Now, there were older models of this that I think had a slightly smaller secondary. I think they were like 54 millimeter. This was years ago when these were first introduced before we had them here in the States. Um, they had a smaller secondary. Those are relatively harder to find. Um, all the production ones now have a larger secondary, which is a 64 millimeter minor axis secondary. Um, how does this compare to a Lori Houghton? Um, now, for those of you who probably don't know what a Lori Houghton is, because it is not a common design at all. A Lori Houghton, I only know one friend of mine who has one because he made it. Um, Lori Houghton uses 
it's very similar to the look of a Mac Newtonian, but it uses like a doublet lens assembly as a corrector, full aperture, and then it's it looks more like a Newtonian. Um, I don't have enough experience with a Lori Houghton to be able to tell you. I'm sure they're very similar in performance, but I, I don't know because I've never had one in my hands to try. So I have to imagine the performance is similar, but if I'm being completely honest, I don't know because Lori Houghton's are very rare uh, telescopes. You don't see them too often, probably because of their complexity to make. Because now instead of just a meniscus lens, which has its one piece of glass with two optical surfaces, a Lori Houghton's using a doublet design. So now you have two optical elements and four surfaces. So it's a more complicated design. So uh, I think that's it, everybody. I don't see any more questions. Um, if you like what you see here, please go ahead and subscribe. Leave a like on a video. It lets us know we're doing a good job. Um, may have to do this one over again so we can talk about the collimation in more detail and see if I can get one in my hands. Um, I haven't had one of these laying around in a while. Um, I think we have them. I just don't personally have one sitting here. Um, but yeah, that is our Starlux 190 overview. Uh, they are very popular telescopes among the people who own them. Um, obviously refractors tend to be more popular because of their simplicity, simplicity. Um, you don't have to collimate them. You don't have to mess with any of that. But you pay for a lot of that. Um, so if you want something that's going to give you a 6 to 7 inch refractor-esque view for a fraction of the price, the MN190 is going to be the scope for you. Um, and it's a great astrograph. And it's a great visual telescope. Um, so, yeah, that's it. Uh, but that's pretty much it for the Starlux 190. Um, next week, we are having our buddy Don Pettit on. Don Pettit is an ISS astronaut with NASA. He's been to the ISS, I think, three times, two or three. He's getting ready to go up for, I believe, a year-long mission. So he's going to be live with us next week um, as our special guest. He's going to be talking about his upcoming flights uh, to the ISS and his new mission that he's training for as well as the Artemis moon missions he's worked with some of the people that are working on that project um, as well as maybe some other fun stuff that uh, he's done we've had him on before so you can go back and watch his episode that he's been on but we're gonna have Don on next week uh, it should be quite a cool show Don's an amazing person um, so join us next week next Friday 10 a.m pacific this will be live and it's recorded so if you have any need to go back and watch it go for it uh, but thank you very much, everyone. If you are at Starfest this weekend, please stop by the Skywatcher booth. Say hi to our team out there. Um, check out some of the stuff. I know they have uh, a FlexTube uh, 350, so our 14-inch go-to is out there. They're showing off the Solar Quest um, and a lot of other new stuff uh, that's out there. So stop by, say hi to them. Enjoy the dark skies. Wish I could be there with you guys, but we'll see you guys uh, next week for Don Pettit. And I hope you have a great weekend. Uh, drink lots of water, stay dry, and we'll talk to you later. Take care. Clear skies, everyone. Bye.